I don't think I ever really believed everything. And I realized that quite a few of the things didn't hold water. The actual religions were man-made from wherever. God? Who's God? What's God? I think skepticism really is the first step. Scientific zest and zeal for the real world. That was it. <laughs> I was an atheist from then on. I got interested in the stars, the amount of stars that were out there. And if you go out to the country, which we... Welcome. Uh, my name is Susan. And my name is Rad. And we are, we are members, members of, of New, New York, York City, City Atheists. Atheists. Today I will be interviewing Rad on his road to atheism. Welcome. So, um, I understand that you were very young when you declared, decided you were an atheist. Oh, indeed I was. I actually, on the road, I started at age eight. Uh, not that I was an atheist or anything like that, but... Uh, I happened to uh, be interested in astronomy, and my father and I went and bought uh, some equipment from uh, uh, Edmonds Scientific Company, which is a company located in New Jersey, and uh, you get many scientific parts for, to, for experimentation and things like that. One of them happens to be a telescope. Now, I wanted to already made telescope, but my father had other ideas. He said, the best thing to do for you to really learn about something is to actually build one from scratch. And so I said, okay, well, how was I going to argue with my father? I'm only eight years of age. So we got the telescope, and I learned how to grind with copper on them the, the, a, a Newtonian telescope, which is a reflector telescope, and you have a mirror at the bottom, and then you have a wedge piece at the top, and it comes out to an eyepiece so that you're able to see uh, with that short amount of distance instead of a long of a type uh, what's called a refracted telescope now it worked i learned how to grind i learned how to do a number of things so my father had other ideas for me, which for me to learn and i learned the basics about astronomy and the tools that are used and then of course naturally once you get that you're able to use your tools a lot better and i did and i found it very effective but what happened along the way of enjoying the sights of the moon and uh, enjoying uh, other things like that, I found that I got interested in the stars, the amount of stars that were out there. And if you go out to the country, which we did a number of the times, you see a lot of things, more stars than you can imagine. And at least 2,000 stars to the eye. In New York City, when you're sitting back there with the fog and, and the clouds. You're lucky if the, you see the moon. You're lucky if you see yeah, the moon that well. And that's what the problem was. So I found out, and I shouldn't say a problem, that's what the glory of it was. When you go out there and you see all that, then you really appreciate that. And the thousands, and I would read the book, and the books on there would say that there are between 200 to 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And that was amazing. And I started to enjoy that, but I remembered certain facts, certain figures. And that would be the basis of my arguments in the future whenever I would discuss this uh, as far as an atheistic point of view. You know, how are we going to build, how are they going to have so many stars and, and probably planets around them? And we found that to be true with the Kepler telescope. Yeah. But to have so many stars that all this is going to be done. And when you read the Bible, there's a conflict there because it says that day four that the heavens were made. And yet it took five days to create little Earth. When you have 200 to 400 billion stars and, and planets, and then you have, when you have between 150 to 200 billion galaxies in the known universe, and each of them have close to a trillion stars, where are you going to get this? It just doesn't make sense that it can be done in one day. And yet you're going to take so many days to create little Earth, especially when you realize what's involved with the planets and everything else. And that just grew in my mind. And there were a lot of factors like that that would just be in conflict with science. And you you start to believe these things because you see what are considered facts, known facts. And that's when at age 10, it solidified in my mind. You know, yep. it, it really made me feel that Must be uh, something about the age there's of something 10. about that. You know, there's something about this Bible. Something's wrong with it. And that's when I started to say, no, you know what? I go by science more than I go by a lot of hocus pocus and a lot of uh, things that are proven, disproven that are in the Bible. Now, your father sounds like he was a bit of 
leaning towards atheism? What family oh, yes, did yes, you come from? Yes, yes, uh, West Indian. My father's from Barbados, my mother's from St. Kitts, the Caribbean. Uh, he was the type to, uh, with his educational background, he wanted to have me search and find the answers rather than him give me the answers, which I think, and I've done this with my children too, is probably the best way to go. Rather than saying, look, this is it. Uh, there's no God, there's this or that. You come to the conclusion yeah. based on what little evidence you have. And that's what happened. And I did. And I came to that conclusion. I said, you know, Dad, this doesn't make sense because so-and-so, he says, why doesn't it make sense? Because such and such and such. And then he would back it up. Well, that's so because of such and such and such. And that was great. It's the best way in which to learn, you know, rather it than is. rather rather than forcing a person to, to say this is one way or it's as bad as somebody saying this is our religion. You have to follow this because this is so. Let me search. Let me find a path. Let me search the way. And that was my search, my road to atheism. And your mother? My mother, she was religious. Oh. She liked the music, and she loved to sing in a choir. And that was the uh, uh, Episcopal Church, you know. So that was that was her thing. And uh, yet later on, later in life, I was uh, kind of convincing her, you know. I said, well, look at the facts and add these things up. And she said, yeah, that's right. But I still love my music. I love Bach. I love Beethoven. I love Brahms. Yeah. So nothing happened. Uh, I was an were, altar boy. Yeah. I was an acolyte. An altar boy. I carried the cross. Did you believe this? I actually carried this and brought up there. I rang the bell. I changed it, did different things uh, for the incense. All this was part insects, incense. All this was part of the, the ritual, you know, uh, that you would have in an Episcopal church as true with other churches. They have different ways of, of sanctioning and recognizing their God. But it was, for me, a perfunctory thing. It was just something that was done because that's what was done. Not that it added any more, any belief or disbelief. It was just that. It was later on that I started realizing things are not so. And uh, I didn't attend church anymore after that. And there was no trouble with the, you know, no, the whole f- no, the no, place. No, no trouble at all. We were the fortunate ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I understand you also became a Marine. Yes, ex-Marine. I'm an ex-Marine. So right. Was, and uh, uh, Vietnam. so there are no atheists in Fox Hollow? Oh, let me, t- <laughs> let me tell you something. You may hear a conservative get up there and say that there are no atheists in Fox Hollow, but that's a lot of BS. I bet. Absolutely. It's not so. There are many of us who just didn't buy into that. Um, the problem was, though, that uh, at that time, in 1962, when I joined the Marines, the United States Marine Corps, uh, the, you had to attend the church services on Sunday. You see, and and those who were Jews had to attend their their uh, synagogue. chaplain synagogue. They had to go that, and and we had to go this. But you couldn't say no. I'm I'm an atheist. You don't dare even mention that. Now it's a whole different ball game. Now you have uh, objectionable reasons, and you can uh, uh, sign up not to go, and that's a good thing. You we know? are making it, it progress. Is, we're making progress, as the Constitution says that you have a right to and you have a right not to. Up to you. It's up to you to do what you feel is best, so, and that's a good thing. However, you still have some organizations that you have in the Air Force, and you do have some yeah. generals that are look down upon those who do not follow the, the religious values that are in the, uh, not only values, but the Bible in, the, in all biblical sense, and that's unfortunate. I think that's going to have to change, and uh, it's going to be up to people like us and, and organizations like us to persuade the, the powers to be that it's your constitutional right not to yeah. follow through that. And I think that's what will happen. Yeah, yeah well, I, I doubt any Christian would want to be forced to attend you know, a synagogue or a mosque or anything like that. So why should atheists be forced to attend a church? Exactly. Yeah. And I think also, I think this is the reason why how I came out of that in my road is what we're going to be doing, finding out how other people came out yes. to find their Avenue and As I said, we were place, fortunate right? because we yeah. lived in the New York City area mm-hmm. where um, you aren't pressured as much. That's right. So after you left the Marines, did you have any problems being an atheist? Oh, no, no. And I left when I came out of the service. Uh, first of all, I was uh, very upset about the war yeah. uh, for lots of reasons. It was buddies. But the fact is that, um, you know, not only 58,000 uh, servicemen uh, died, yeah. but probably countless millions of uh, natives, uh, yeah. indigenous people over there yeah. died as well that we don't talk about. And, and yet they're still suffering from a lot of the effects of Agent Orange and everything yeah. else that uh, has happened. And and unexploded bombs and whatnot yeah. that are going off, and the children are getting them. It's maiming a lot of people. But besides that, 
um, I became more cynical about many things. And, and I think it's not a bad idea to be a little cynical. Yes. You know, it, it's keeping an open mind, not just following through by because orders say to do such, but start to question different things as a civilian, which I couldn't question as a military. You just follow the orders. Yeah. That's it. As they say, you do or die. And that's basically that. So, um, let's see. And so, did you, you, you find that it's more advantageous to be an atheist? Oh, gee, yes. I, I, it opens up so many avenues, so many vistas. That's, that's fantastic. You see things through a different lens, and, 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 and it's not colored through um, uh, set values and beliefs, right, of a Neolithic-type thinking which is a Bronze Age way of yeah. thinking, you know. Uh, and, of course, in college, as you know, this is very, very important. You work on critical thinking and deductive reasoning, not yes. inductive reasoning, but deductive reasoning. Yes. And that's a big difference there. And you, you started on that road you, when you were at eight. Yes, 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 indeed. And and I kept that open. And then that's important. And my father would make sure, you know, after all, I didn't read the Daily News. I read the New York Times. Yes. <laughs> and it, there's a big difference in that. I'm not to advertise for them. But the idea is that you look for many different and nuanced ways of seeing things. And you come to those conclusions based on a lot of material, a lot of empirical evidence, scientific and the latest evidence that's available. And that's the beauty of that. So I go by and whenever I have a discussion with anybody, okay, and I say discussion, yes. I don't say argument, but a true discussion, I try to listen to their point of view, which unfortunately, if they're very religious, they don't listen to our point of view. They already have their minds made up. And, yes. that, and that's that's too bad. For those who do keep an open mind, then I tell them, I say, listen, my feelings are based on empirical evidence. I come to a conclusion based on empirical evidence and not by, which is the latest scientific means. So I can't really lose on a, on a, dis a discussion argument. I said, however, you're going and you're basing your opinions, as far as I can see, on hearsay, superstition, myths, and church dogma. And there's a big difference. You can't make any adjustment. You can't make any changes on that. And that's where you wind up not winning yeah. the true argument, the true discussion. And that's unfortunate because that hurts and it holds on for your life that same way. Yeah. Okay. I'm free. I'm open to many different things. And I don't fear things. I don't look up worry that if I say something that's wrong, that lightning is going to strike me. Or you're difference. going to end up down there. Yes, and you'd be surprised if I say that to a group of people if that so and so I am an atheist, and if I'm if God doesn't like that light, lightning will strike me, and watch how many people look up in the sky and back away from me. That's because of that mindset that they have, and that fearful mindset is unfortunate. Yeah, it is. So um, you recently, how long have you been really an active atheist? Oh, gee, active atheist. <laughs> I would say since probably in my 30s, my 30s, I, I would discuss this with anybody and have discussions. And for those, by the way, of you in New York City, there is a, there at that time when I was doing this, there were there are places in Manhattan called uh, the um, Union Square. It's yes. a good example, a very active area. You have a lot of people who will come out. And this is one good way to, to test your skills, as it were. Uh, you have a lot of groups who come from other areas, from Kansas, from upstate New York, and tourists. Yeah. No, not necessarily no. tourists, but these are groups where it's led by a mentor, and they have their young teens or young adults who bring them over there who are, I don't want to say brainwashed, but are with they the, are. But they are. <laughs> and they have these ideas as to how they're going to um, uh, affect and, and change everybody, proselytize their faith on everybody, and I can't wait to deal with them. I get right out there. When they start talking and they get on that soapbox, and then they get up with a microphone or a megaphone, and they start talking, and uh, right away I question every darn thing they say, and you should see what happens. At that moment, that's when a person in the crowd comes over to me and says, uh, I'd like to discuss that with you. Can we have some coffee and sit down over at uh, Starbucks or whatnot? And I say, why do, you want, why do you want to have coffee? Oh, I just wanted to back away and have a discussion. He is there as yeah. one of their agents to make sure that I'm oh. quiet so that it doesn't interfere oh. with their, 
and it happens every time. Every time the same individual or individuals like that person oh. do, does that. So I know that. You know, I move around to make sure they can't get there. But I'm the get, get fly. I'm the one that gives them a hard time, and it's embarrassing for them because they can't get yeah. the answer that they want to do. And other people start to question it and yeah. say, wait, this person said such and such. Yes. Is that so, Mr. Speaker? Uh, 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 and the speaker doesn't yeah. know what to say, and that ruins his whole presentation, yes. which is exactly what I want to do. Yes. That was and my you're intention. just asking questions. Yeah, as questions. That. That's it. Then they can't come up with the right yeah. answers of that. They can't. You know? Okay. Um. And uh, you mentioned you had children. They're okay with your atheism? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Not, not only are my children okay with uh, atheists, but uh, uh, my girlfriend has happens to uh, be Jewish, and, uh, and her nephews... There are three nephews, uh, whose father is very religious, by oh, the way. <laughs> but they uh, they sat down with me and they questioned me, and uh, guess what? They're on the road to atheism. You better believe they are. <laughs> Your father's very upset by oh, that. Dear. But, but it's yeah, interesting, it you know. I mean, that's that's okay. It's having a discussion, and they were open minded to it. Thank goodness for that. Yes, you know. Yes. yes. So I think we are so fortunate, having lived in New York City. Yes. That we can experience so much and not be forced to experience any one particular uh, religious indoctrination or That's anything right. like that because you hear about other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. So we are very fortunate and eventually we will, um, we will speak to others who will probably have more traumatic experiences That's than you right. or I. And I hope you folks are going to listen to us and listen to our programs. They're going to be interesting. The individuals on there are also going to give their excuses or their reasons as to why they believe or why they disbelieve what's going came on. came to disbelieve, actually. came to that and how they did that. What were the conclusions? What were the things that made them come to those conclusions? It's going to be very interesting. I hope you're going to be with us. Are there any books you can suggest that these people could read? Yes. Yes. One of the good books to read, believe it or not, is Revelations, the Bible. <laughs> I think the Bible is probably the best thing to read, believe it or not. Yes. Because then you can see the heresy. You can see the the, the fallacies and the contradictions. There are over 700 contradictions in the Bible, many errors and a lot of plagiarism that's in there. I can get and tell you all these different things. We don't have the time to do it now, but I'll tell you this. Read the Bible. There's a very good book out uh, that says about the, it's called the, the Skeptic's um, Guide to Bible. Yeah, and it's very effective. But in Evel in 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 oh, I'm sorry, in Revelations, Revelations is very interesting. It's the last part of the uh, New, Testament. New Testament. It has things in there that you're going to find that unbelievable. A woman who was having a baby or just about to have one is hidden by the sun, and she has a foot on top of the moon. Yes, really? <laughs> no, and and uh, like, people will come back. Those who are religious will come back and say, "Well, you know, that's that is basically uh, a metaphor." Well, I don't worship metaphors, and that's all that's in the book. Everything is a metaphor, a metaphor, a metaphor. We don't worship metaphors. We believe and not worship, but believe in scientific results and facts. I don't worship metaphors, and that's another reason and another good argument you can have in place when they make some a statement like that. Well, we always say in New York City, atheists, if you want to make someone an, an, an atheist, have them read the Bible. That's right. From cover to cover. That's it. Are there any other books like from Dawkins or people like that you think would be helpful? Oh, yes. I think The God Delusion uh, from Richard Dawkins, uh, author who is a, uh, um, a, a, a uh, well acclaimed individual, a person who, who has uh, written many books, by the way. That's not only the one book that he, he has written, but he has other books that are out there. I think uh, you will find that uh, uh, he, in addition to, um, what is the person who um, uh, died, have passed away, I can't oh, Hitchens. Hitchens uh, has uh, another book uh, called God is Not Great, and, and the second title on that is Religion Poisons Everything. A very good book also. And there are a number of books that are out there it's just uh, uh, it's important to look them up and you can go to any local bookstore or Barnes and Noble or any of them and you'll find there's uh, information on that very effective read them get an idea of what they're talking about they have a lot of valuable facts and information on there that you can use in your discussions and also for you to think openly when you see the facts that are out there and there is Google 
which is how I found New York City atheists. And there are a lot of great sites by people who are on the road to atheism or people who are actually atheists out there. Um, I think we are now becoming more vocal yes. about or non-belief. Let me add something to yes. that, okay? Uh, I would suggest this, and this is very important. A lot of young people now, and in fact, you have the ability and you have the means, if you get on the internet, to look up debates. Debates are very, very important. There are a lot of good debates out there, and you can, once you listen to a debate between a person who is an established individual on atheism and the other side, you will find that the arguments that the uh, religious side poses really has no roots. It has no leg. They have no legs to stand on. That's the key. And the more that people see those uh, debates on the internet, the quicker they become non-religious and more open-minded and atheists. A good person to, to look up is Sam Harris. Yes. yes. And he does debates. Right. And he's positively fabulous. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he has one, I believe, that's with Notre Dame. That one is outstanding. And I think that's great. And, of course, you have others out there, but they're all good. And, and, and Hitchens is fantastic when it comes to debates. He, <laughs> he tears the person down. I mean, actually, on dresses that person. Emperor, you have no clothes. And that's what happens. He's really good. I think they're all good. They're, he's part of the Four Horsemen. And uh, it's worthwhile to see those. We are now, you know, in the 21st century, the third millennium. Mm -hmm. and it is time to put away childish things and grow up. That's right. This is where it's at. We're not in the Bronze Age and the Neolithic Age anymore. And we've got to break away from that and the fears and stuff of that nature, mostly by hearsay. And what's written down was by different groups of people, even competing among themselves. And it's just an unfortunate thing because that is what a person is basing their life on and basing their values. When it comes to values and morals, the Bible is the worst place to yes. go for morals. You know, you have three different type of Ten Commandments in the Bible. You have many, many things that are out and out shame when you look at it. And, and there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, misogyny in the Bible as well. Women are treated, and this involves all three Abrahamic <laughs> religions. And it condones okay? slavery. So. It condones slavery, and a lot of people don't even know that. Luke 12, verses 47, 48 is a good example for those who think that uh, the, the Bible is something that's really worshipful, find out who said that. I won't even tell you, but you're going to see that surprise, the person who made that statement about that. Condone slavery and the, so many stripes of beating them. Read it. Thank you very much for listening to our interview today, and we will see you again.